Well, what a pleasure to welcome you here today. I must say, it's also a great honour for me to be with you all. Today's talk is in three parts. And the first session is about material discoveries. So I'll be the storyteller. There's, uh, it's, it's simply sit back and relax. But part two, we do a deep dive into the meaning of what was discovered and what it means for the individual. And then uh, session three is all about a project and bringing, if you like, material discoveries and matching it with some values. And it's a project that's dear to my heart. So uh, let's start about uh, the material discoveries. But we're just going to um, begin with a couple of principles. And these are free will. I wanted to mention free will because it's respected throughout the universe, basically. Every um, person, their free will is honoured and it's something that we should remember when we are engaging with other people. So today, if I suggest anything, you have free will to do it or not. Now, This is, this is interesting. All human beings have the ability to discern truth. Now, it's not an ability that's connected to any amino acid chain in your DNA. It's actually a spiritual endowment which comes as part of your personality. Now, it's distributed, this endowment is distributed equally to all people of all generations. So everyone has the sensitivity to discern truth. And today, I'd like you to dial up your sensitivity. So, um, okay, next point. Are we accidents or are we here with purpose? And basically, this is the crux of the talk. It's, it's like the framework. And obviously, I'm going to take the path of describing purpose. Now, purpose is a word that could be um, substituted for meaning. So what's the meaning of life? And this is, after giving it a little bit of thought, I can divide it into two parts. One, you're experiencing life. That's it. That is the meaning. You, you are here, you are experiencing, you're in your body. That's the meaning. But there's a second half to it. And the second half is to become one with the divine within and above. That is the second half of the equation. Now, 2,000 years ago, a man, and I'll use that word emphatically, a human man, demonstrated what you can do with human potentials in expressing the full meaning of life by putting in a huge effort in attuning himself to the divine within. And we're going to dive into that in session two. All right. This is interesting and I'll try to be as quick as possible. A prayer generally has some sort of self-interest. You ask for something. You, know, you say a prayer, I say, I'd like this or solve this problem. Or you might move into worship and you're just in a state of gratitude and grace. But I tried something very different a few years ago and I couldn't describe it until yesterday a name came up called the flip prayer. Now, what's a flip prayer? The flip prayer 
is basically where you put a request node. You make time available, unconditional, and this is the beginning of my journey. I made time available. I wasn't asking for anything. I wasn't worshipful. I was very casual. And I made three weeks available. I had a certain amount of funds. And I basically said, all yours. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. I'll go anywhere, travel anywhere on the globe, carry out any task. It was very casual. I didn't expect anything to happen. About 10 days later, the phone went and I had an invitation to go to Mexico to do a 10-day workshop, shamanic workshop. Very interesting. Two days after that, I had another invitation to visit the Pitninjara tribe in Central Australia to learn about secret men's business. Very interesting, a great cultural experience. Then 24 hours after that, I received another invitation to visit Sai Baba in India. Now, Sai Baba is a well-known guru in India and has done a lot of great social work and is renowned for manifesting all sorts of minor miracles like his divine ash and divine nectar and so forth. Anyway, and in a bit of a dilemma, I went to my good friend Trevor Jones here, <laughs> who owns Hawthorne Travel, and I said, Trevor, where would you go? I've got this dilemma. And he sits in his chair, you know, and he sits back and I hear the brain, you know, the turning over and then all of a sudden one word pops out. He goes, Jerusalem. And I jumped. I said, that's it. And he leans forward. He goes, not going to send you. I said, come on, come on. Book me a ticket. He said, no, not going to send you. There's an intifada. There's a war going on in Israel. I said, don't worry. So after some arm twisting, a little bit of bribery or promise of a bottle of wine, he booked me a ticket. Next thing I find myself in Israel, handing my passport to the uh, immigration officer, and I asked for a, a slip, not a stamp, but a slip, because I wanted to visit some other countries. The slip raised some attention with the immigration officer. Anyway, I get my passport, I step in, and I'm surrounded by two security guys, and I'm taken to a room, put in the room, and in this room there's one stainless steel table. He said, wait here. Five minutes later, my bag turns up, it's put on the stainless steel table, the, the officer walks out. Ten minutes after that, a military officer walks in, a young female, and she says, please open your bag. So I open the bag. She says, why are you here in Jerusalem? I said, I'm a tourist. She said, there are no tourists coming to Israel. Sorry, Tel Aviv. She said, why are you here in Tel Aviv? And I said, well, I'm a tourist. And she said, no, don't buy it. She said, who are you meeting here? I said, no one. Where are you staying? I said, don't know, don't have a hotel. Have you booked a car? No, I haven't booked a car. And the questioning went on. And instead of the questioning to being a straight line, it turned into a circuitous route. And it turned into a type of interrogation. So she's unpacking my bag, going through everything, till she came to the last item in the bag, which was a male cylinder, about a metre long. And she said, what's in this? And I said, maps. And she said, they're not tourist maps. They're too big for tourist maps. And I said, have a look. So she opened up the mail tube, rolled out the maps, and she said, these are high-definition contour maps. What's going on? And I said, look, if you look at where they're all, they're all about the old city in Nazareth. I'm here to study the geography of Nazareth. And she, go, he, she goes, oh. And then all of a sudden the story fell into place. And she said, you're free to go. I turned up in Nazareth late, about four o'clock, and I had nowhere to stay, right? So I'm in Nazareth and I could not find a bed for love and money. I thought the hotels would have been open, but everyone was closed. So I bashed on the door of a particular hotel for about two minutes. And then about two floors up, the shutters of a window opened up 
this man stuck his head out of the window and he goes, we're closed, can't you see? And I said, look, I'm desperate. I've been traveling for 30 hours. I need a place to stay. And he hesitated and then he said, look, if you walk up this road a little bit more and turn left up the alleyway, go up about 200 yards or 200 meters and you'll see the entrance to a convent. And I knocked on a door, I told them my situation, they let me in, and this is what confronted me, which is the entrance to the convent. And it was so peaceful. I had, I, it was like stepping into another realm. So, I went to bed, next morning, I get up, walk down to the breakfast room, one place setting, unrolled my maps, and the sister comes up and says, cup of coffee? And I said, thank you. And then she said, hmm, they're not tourist maps. And I'm going, I've heard that before. And she says, what are you, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I sort of just want to get a feel of where the house of Jesus might have been 2,000 years ago. Now, why was I travelling with contour maps? Here's a quote from a book. The home of Jesus was not far from a high hill in the northern, northerly part of uh, Nazareth, some distance from a village spring, which was in the eastern se uh, section of town. The family dwelt in the outskirts of the city. The home was located a little to the south and east of a southern promontory. Okay? Uh, about midway between the base of this elevation and the road leading um, out of Nazareth. So, I was able to do some basic triangulation. And I spent the day um, walking, taking compass readings and so forth. Now, the second morning, I get up, I go down and the sister says to me, how'd you go yesterday? And I said, well, you know, I've narrowed it down to 500 metres by 500 metres square. I think it was something somewhere in this area. And she goes, look, since you're really interested in archaeological sites, under the convent we have a dig going on. And she said, would you like to have a look at it? And I go, oh, it'd be terrific. So we walk down this hallway and we come to a bit of uh, some steel iron gates at the end of the hallway, gets the big old key, opens up the gates, and there's a marble staircase leading under the, under the convent. And so I thought, oh, this is interesting. At the first level, we come to, uh, she said, look up. And there was a Crusader dome, which was built about a 1,000 years ago. Just a small cupola, like, um, but very nice. I said, oh, that's interesting. And then we walked down another flight of stairs and we came to a little alcove where there was uh, some sort of religious ceremony that had happened. And they dated it to about 300 AD. So... The site is under, that window looks down into the dig. Now, we went further and we found ourselves in a first century home under the convent. And this is where I was standing. This is the doorway to a first century home and I was suitably impressed but I suffered from tunnel vision and I said to the sister, look, I've really got to go and finish my mapping. And she looked at me somewhat quizzically, like just sort of, okay. And I left and I went to do the rest of my mapping. That night, I go to bed and at two o'clock in the morning, I just woke startled. I woke up and I thought, I've made a mistake. And I'd taken the north drop line, if you like, from the top of the hill, from the wrong spot. Because I remembered I'd seen a dam, a reservoir, and they always put the reservoir at the highest point of the hill. And I'd originally t taken the drop line from a, a big school that's up there, a big college on the, on the rise. And when I moved the line and I dropped it down into the old city, well, it crossed with the lines from Mary's well and right on the promontory 
at the site where I was staying in the convent. Then I realised that the home was the site under the convent was the home of the Holy Family. So I was awake for two or three hours and then at 5am when the sisters went to prayer, I'm there in the courtyard and I'm all excited and all excited and I'm going, do you know what you've got here? You know, like, seriously, look, it's a perfect match. And they just smiled. They did not say a word and they went off to the chapel and they had their morning prayers. Well, this began a, this began a story. Okay. Another bit of evidence why I think the home is the home or the site. The only real accident Jesus had up to the time was a fall down the backyard stone stairs which led up to the canvas roof bedroom. It happened during an unexpected sandstorm from the east. Now you're probably saying, where am I getting this information from? I always like to check my sources of information. A lot of people would know about the Arantia book. A lot of people don't know about the Urantia book. It makes a lot of statements, particularly about the life and times of Joshua ben Joseph, a.k.a. Jesus. Joshua ben Joseph as a man. Stone stairs. They were the stone stairs that he tripped down. After I realised it was a home, I spent five days photographing the entire site. The sisters gave me carte blanche. I, I photographed every stone, took measurements, um, did some research on the history of the place. Then I found out an archaeologist by the name of Father Senes had been there in the early 1950s and he'd written quite a quite a lot of reports. Now, I decided to go and look for these reports and I went into all the Jerusalem libraries and there was the card of Father Senes but when I would go to the shelves all the documents were missing, library after library and I went to the Ecole Biblique, one of the most prestigious and secure libraries in Jerusalem and there was the card in the drawer, Father sent us the, the uh, archaeological notes of the Sisters of Nazareth, missing. And I heard, I heard, that the only way documents can disappear or move or be moved from uh, such a library is by instruction from the Vatican. Could be true, I presume so. It's a very highly secure library. It's only for academics. So the plot thickens. Who wants to hide the location of this home? So after a few years of searching, I found out through the sisters that there'd been a visitor from the Vatican by the name of Father Livio. So I spent quite a bit of time tracking down Father Livio and eventually caught up with him in Geneva and I was with my colleague Neil Franci and we had a meeting with Father Livio and we asked him, he actually asked us, he said, why are you here? And we said, we're looking for the research notes of Father Sanus and he leant back in his chair and he said, they are very, very difficult to find. And we go, we know, we've searched every library and can't find them. And he goes, hmm, he said, wait. A quarter of an hour later, he comes back with a library trolley of documents. Father Livio slid across the table all the research notes of Father Senes. Then he slid across the table all the references that went back to 300 AD. And then I found out he trained as an archeologist, so he had provided his opinion of the site 
and provided those documents. So there were three big piles of documents sitting in front of Neil and I. And he said, you're welcome to copy them. That was an extremely generous gift from Father Livio. We took all the documents, Father Livio departed. We took, put all the documents back on the library trolley, pushed them down a the hallway, and then we came to a landing. And at the end of the landing, my jaw dropped. And Father Livio's, uh, Father Livio's secretary, Yvette, whispered in my ear, she said, you are looking at 50,000 religious texts because in front of me was three floors of library books and down on the lower floor I could see a team of librarians. One of the biggest collection of religious texts ever. Extraordinary. So we copied the texts and here's a, a shot, a photo of all the documents, piles and piles of documents of Father Senes, other works, there's also a PhD work of uh, some people from Canada who did the study of the site. So you can see there are a lot of documents all supporting the conclusion that I came to from a different path. A few years after I had um, come to the conclusion that this was the house, the sisters appointed Professor Ken Dark from Reading University to conduct a professional archaeological study of which he probably nearly spent a decade and only just recently published his book. This is his book of, the, of his work and it's basically a confirmation of what I've told you. He also used a lot of the reference material of Father Senes and the work that uh, Father Livio handed across. So it's a bit of a teamwork. Now the reason why this is controversial is that the, the Roman Catholic Church has built a huge basilica in Nazareth stating that they've got the site. So it's controversial. Now Professor Ken Dark has more or less said he believes it's the home, the holy home. Then the story really gets cooking. Because in 2003, a very good friend of mine, Mark McBurney, wanted to visit Nazareth. And I said, look, let's meet in Heathrow, because he was visiting family up in Scotland. And um, we'll, we'll go to Nazareth, I'll show you. So in 2003, Mark McBurney and I flew to Tel Aviv on an overnight flight. Now, I say that with some caution because something happened. So our plan is to go to Nazareth because Martin wanted to have a look at the site. Now when we got on the plane I said to Martin, look, why don't we call past Jerusalem? I said it's a fantastic city. It's really vibrant, it's you know it's got a lot of colour, there's so much going on. And he goes, I don't want to do grotto hopping in Jerusalem. And I thought, fair enough. And I said, really? You've travelled all this way and you don't want to just swing by for a day? No. So I tempted him. I said, look, we have some information about where the tomb of Jesus might be. How would you like to go looking for it? He said, oh, really? And I go, I go, yeah, come on, come on, you know, get into it. He said, I'll give you eight hours. I said, eight hours? You want me to look, you want me to do an archaeological search in eight hours? He says, yeah, look, I just have a look around, you know. I said, oh, okay. So then we fall asleep on the plane. It was an over, overnight flight. We get into Tel Aviv at 5am, catch a bus up to Jerusalem. We stay in the... Uh, 
Mount of Olives Hotel, which is a great place. It overlooks the old city. It's magnificent, magnificent. 5 a.m. in the morning, we can't sleep. We both put on our walking shoes and head down through Gethsemane, down Mount of Olives, up through St. Stephen's Gate and into the old city. Now, from a quote from the Urantia book. They decided to bury Jesus in Joseph's new family tomb, hewn out of solid rock, located a short distance north, north of Golgotha, across the road leading to Samaria. The tomb of Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, a very good friend of Jesus and his family, the tomb was in his garden on a hillside on the eastern side of the road and also facing towards the east. They carried the body into the tomb, a chamber of about 10 square feet. So, we knew roughly where the tomb was. The planted thought. Now, this is interesting. And this is where you have to use your sense of what is true. Because when I was standing at the carousel getting my luggage in Tel Aviv with Martin, and we we're about to get on a bus to go from Tel Aviv up to the hills into Jerusalem, I say to Martin, do you know I had dinner with Urs Rukti? I'll tell you about Urs Rukti in a moment in Paris, it was two days before I met Martin, and I said, Uz Rukti told me the tomb is 800 metres north of the Damascus Gate. So he gave me a distance. And Martin goes, really? I said, yeah, he told, I swear, he told me over dinner, 800 metres. I said, I trust Uz. Because Uz Rukti translated this book into German. It was a massive job. I consider Urs one of the great academics and knowledgeable people of this massive work. So when I said it's 800 metres north of Damascus Gate and it was Urs, Martin said, OK. So we bought a tourist map, a genuine tourist map. We scribed an 800 metre arc because there was a little um, distance legend on the bottom corner. And so we knew that the tomb was on this 800 metre arc. We knew it was in the north, which the arc was. We knew that the rock face faced east. And guess what? Four hours later, I find myself standing on the roof of a rock ledge and Martin's down below on the footpath and he looks up and there is what we would describe as a cave. But then I realised no ordinary cave because... The rock ledge was carved and that's the compass pointing east. All right. 99 square feet. I went into the tomb and measured it. And we took a whole lot of measurements but the most important one is 99 square feet, which is 10 feet by 10 feet, which matches exactly the dimensions in the book. So I ask you, what are the chances of finding a tomb in the heart of Jerusalem facing exactly the right direction, having exactly the dimensions we were looking for within four hours? So, this is what we found. There is the cut rot ledge, entrance into the tomb. Martin and I were speechless for four hours. We sat in the gardens of a nearby hotel called the American Colony and just were speechless because now we had to work out what are we going to do. There's another... Another photo, you'll get a sense of it from this photo. 
You can see it was covered in rubbish. In fact, there was an old toilet cistern inside the tomb and I was so offended by it, I was about to throw it out. And Martin said, Steve, that's what's protecting it. Leave it. Leave all the rubbish around it. Leave it until we can work out what we're going to do. There we go, yours truly. Okay, we came back to Australia. We appointed some lawyers, Arnold Block Liebler here in Melbourne, and they suggested we appoint Herzog Fox Naiman in Tel Aviv. This is where it starts to get a little bit interesting. I made two reports, one on the home, all our logic, or my logic, rationale, reasoning, about why I think the house in Nazareth is the holy home. Then I wrote a second report, the discovery of the tomb in Jerusalem and all our references. Then I made a brief summary in a registered envelope and I sent myself 300 registered letters dated 2005. This is a legal document. Then I sealed all the reports, the larger reports, in registered envelopes, 2005. They contain all the information of the two discoveries. Okay, I didn't realise how fortuitous that was a decade later. I just thought I'd do this for fun. I laid out 300 envelopes or a couple of hundred and turned it into a bit of a, an artwork. There's the piles. That's the report on Nazareth. The Friendship Discovery, or Friendship Garden, which it soon became. Registered and sealed. In 2005, a meeting was called between Herzog Fox Naiman, Jerusalem's top archaeologist, Professor Mir Bendov. In attendance at the site was Martin McBurney and Joanna Kajawa, who was recording, making notes about the event. Professor Mir Bendov walks up to the tomb, leans in, dates it within 30 seconds. He said, this is phenomenal. He said, we have walked over every inch of this, of Jerusalem for years and we've never ever discovered it. It's like it was invisible, it was, it was hidden. He said, I can't believe it, I can't believe it. He said, you know that only a handful were ever made because they're so expensive to build and it takes a lot of skill. Also in attendance was a representative from HFN, Yaakov Brandt, property director. Knows all about properties in Jerusalem. So they're the material discoveries. And you think that's interesting. Wait till session two. Enjoy your coffee. Thank you. <laughs>
personal growth. We're going to talk about mindfulness, which is um, very important. So let's begin. Um, the, the key, the key here is union, union of wills. This is, I believe, the purpose in life. Now, I haven't been to the Library of Congress, but if I was to go in and go to the religious section, I would be confronted with 360,000 religious texts. Now, if I was to relieve read one text a day for a thousand years, I would be the world's greatest theologian because I study other people's religious experiences. The problem is I haven't had my own religious experience. So here's the key. Life is all about having your own personal religious experience in being totally immersed in life. Now, I'm going to recount a little story. I made it up. And I made it up on, because of my experiences with the invitations that I received that I told you about in the beginning of the first session. So there's a young boy. He had six older brothers and sisters. And one day he decided, hmm, I'd like to do something for my father. So he decided to clean up the tool shed. And after a few hours on a weekend, he looked at the tool shed and he was very happy. It, it looked great. But he wasn't satisfied. So he thought, hmm. A couple of weekends later, he cleaned up the backyard, mowed the lawn, and it looked great. A few weeks passed. Ah, he's still not satisfied. So uh, his brothers and sisters are all playing with their various games and entertaining themselves. And they're very dismissive of his actions. They just say, why are you doing this, you know? He says, it's all right, well, I'm happy. And then he thought, I think I'll go and talk to my father directly, who was working, up in, a, working in a study upstairs. And the, others, the other children said, you can't disturb Dad. He said, no, 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 it's all right. I'm, I think it'll be okay. So he walks up the stairs and then he walks along the hallway and he comes to the door of the study and he knocks on the door and instantly the door opens and he got a shock. And his father smiled and he said, I heard you walking up the hallway. He said, come in, son. He said, take a seat. Take a seat on the couch. What's on your mind? He said, oh, look, I'd like to do something for you. Something really, uh, you know, something that you would like. He said, I've, I've had a guess, you know. He said, oh, yeah. and the father said, oh, I know, I've been, I'm aware. Now, like any parent, if a child comes up and said, I'd like to do something for your dad or mum, the parent would be obviously very chuffed, very happy. But the parent knows what the young child would like or likes. So the father thinks, hmm, he says, do you want to go for a bike ride? The young boy says, oh, bike riding. He goes, that's a good idea. And then the young boy thought, oh, I don't think my dad's into bike riding, though. And he goes, the father says, um, hmm, that doesn't appeal. What about we go down the beach? And again, the, the young boy said, oh, well, um, I don't think dad would like the beach either. So he says, no, I'll pass on that, dad. And then he goes, uh, movies. So we're up to invitation number three. So the movies. And the young boy thought, no, nah, what I'm into, my dad's not into. So invitation number four, the father turns around to his young son and he says, how about we go for a hike up into the hills? And the young boy said, that's it. That's it. We'll do that. So off they go. And the father said, look, I'll pack I'll pack a tent and we'll camp overnight and we'll set up a campfire and we'll have a good catch up. And the young boy said, fantastic. So off they go and they have a terrific weekend. 
Anyway, on Sunday morning, they start to pack up and they start to walk home through the forest and they come home and as they approach the house, all the other siblings are looking at the window and hanging at the door wondering, what happened? You know, what's going on? What's going on? And the young boy had a smile from ear to ear. He was so happy. And so the boy goes into the house and all the other siblings are saying, you know, how was it? And he said, fantastic. And so eventually all the other children started running upstairs and saying, oh, Dad, you know, we really want to hang out. And so over the next six or eight months, they all got to have their different experiences because every child's got different likes. As time passed, this household became renowned for good company, generosity of spirit and loss of humour. Now, I'm going to give you an interpretation about God's will. The first one, it, it develops. Religion is evolutionary. It evolved from, you know, worshipping rocks and then we started to get into nature spirits and then we started to worship gods in the heaven and slowly our ideas of religion grew and grew and grew. Instead of a vengeful God, we, we moved into a loving father, you know. It, it's constantly evolving. So, some people say, oh, it's God's will. It's a disconnection. There's no personal relationship. And this is the key. We're starting to move into personal relationship territory. It's not my will that your will be done. This is a form of negation. You would have heard it, but it is a type of negation. Then we move into the third one. It's my will, your will be done. Then, this is a positive affirmation. Okay, so it's developing. Then we come to the fourth one. The father inviting his son for a walk up into the mountains. It's a union of wills. I call this the supreme partnership and this is where magic starts to happen. Okay, I'm just going to di diverge a little bit because this is important. Before Joshua ben Joseph, and I like using the name Joshua ben Joseph instead of Jesus because there seems to be a bit of baggage around the name Jesus. This was his birth name, his family name. Now I keep saying as a man. I'll come back to that. Now women had little or no spiritual standing in older religions. We know that. What you don't know is that Joshua ben Joseph appointed women evangelists as a team, 50 of them and 12 apostles. He was one of the greatest liberators of women's uh, rights, particularly in that generation when men wouldn't even speak to women. Uh, he was a great liberator. And this is really important. Now you say, how do I know this? because it's very detailed in this particular book about what Joshua, what Joshua did. Um, and I want to restate this because women can have a deep and personal relationship with the divine as per 
as per the male. I mean, God created man and woman. As a father, the father wants a relationship with the daughters as much with the men, the sons. So wherever you see religious prejudice, be cautious. Okay. And I want to talk about Mary Magdalene. She had a bit of a bum, bum rap. She was one of the most effective teachers of the gospel among a group of 12 women that were set aside from the 50. How about that? No longer can man presume to monopolise ministry of religious service. Now, whether you find yourself ministering outside of a religious group or inside a religious group, you, you should, you, it's carte blanche. There's no restriction. I wanted to mention that to bring some balance because I think in the past it's been very unbalanced. Now, we're going to do some deep diving. The most honourable, venerable teacher of one of the greatest teachers of all time, Buddha. What has this to do with the discoveries in Jerusalem? Quite a lot, in fact, through personal experience. For those that don't know, and for those that are watching this video, Vipassana, Vipassana meditation is a demanding meditation technique. It can go for 10 days, it can go for 30 days. Uh, you meditate every day in different blocks for a few hours. And while you're in this retreat, you do not make eye contact with anyone. You do not speak to anyone. You do not have a mobile phone. You do not have a pen and paper. You go in with nothing. In fact, on the gate where I went, there was a sign saying, leave all religious traditions and rituals here at the gate. Now this posed a bit of a dilemma because I can't take the divine out of my heart and leave it at the gate. So I turned a dilemma into an opportunity and I said a bit of a flip prayer. In other words, it was an invitation. There was, I wasn't asking for anything. I wasn't, there's was nothing personal. I just said, come, let's do this together, a union. Let's do this meditation retreat together. So in a way, I spiritized it. Now, the teachers suggest you don't share your personal experiences because you set up what's called... Um, I think called sankharas or a bit of karma. In other words, when you're in that meditation retreat, what happens in the meditation retreat stays in the meditation retreat. You don't share it. But I've done a cost benefit analysis. <laughs> and I think the benefit outweighs the cost. And what I'm sharing is actually written in a lot of religious texts in the East. And this is what happens. This is what happened, and this is the insight that I gained. Around day five, very, very deep in meditation and having worked through a lot of issues and trying to remain equanimous, I reached some territory where everything, everything turned into light particles, dancing light particles. My mind's eye saw everything. This is a type of, well, these light particles are referred to in the Eastern texts as kalapas, spelt with a K if you want to look it up, kalapas. 
And there, if you want to put it in terms of quantum physics, they're like energy particles coming in, coming out of existence very quick. So you're in this ocean of light particles that are, that are just dancing. And it is suggested that at this moment, Buddha said, all things change. That's true. All things change. But as I was reflecting on the situation I found myself in, I thought, hmm, it's interesting. Do I change? And then one of the greatest universe paradoxes became very clear. And I may be able to give you an explanation. Because me is the paradox. You are the paradox. And the paradox is this. Personality is changeless, but undergoes constant change. It is the only thing in the universe that holds this quality. And I thought, how can that be? How can we stay the same? Stephen, I'll always be acknowledged or known as Stephen, but undergo constant growth. Okay. Then it became apparent. Personality is not, is not a part of the time-space universe. Personality is a gift of God. God exists outside of the time-space universe. You are a son and daughter of God. Your personality is a gift. If you want another definition of God, I can give you one of the best you'll ever hear. And it's from that book, so I don't claim to have worked that one out. But God is personality. God can be nothing less than personality because we exist. We are personalities. God can be nothing less. So, this conclusion is also in this book. It said, you are children of God. So, now what? In this state of what they often call samadhi, I thought, okay, that's a nice conclusion. Let's get on with the meditation. It confirmed what I'd read. I'd experienced, I, I could see what the, what the paradox was and I came to believe in the in the uh, explanation. So I said, okay, what now? So the meditation finishes. Uh, four or five days later. And there's a, uh, what we call dining hall. And in the dining hall there, at the at one end of the dining hall, there's a servery bench. And I walked over to the servery bench and I ordered a uh, peppermint tea, I think it was, and I had my back to the room. And as I'm waiting for my peppermint tea to brew and get some honey or whatever, I hear these words. And this person says, I would like what you have. I couldn't see it, you know, obviously I was looking. And I thought, oh, I wonder who they're talking to. And I heard someone else say, yes, we would like what you have. And I go... I'm wondering, that's strange. And at the third time, when I heard it for the third time, I turned around and the entire meditation group was standing in a semicircle around me, looking at me. And they were all asking the same question. And I'm going, now you, I don't know what's going on here and you might have an explanation and you can work, work it out for yourself. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't know what I can give you even if I knew what it was. And they were insistent. And I took my cup of tea, I walked out of the dining room, along the, the walkway and into my bunk room. Everyone followed. 30 people, 
followed all the way. They were hanging out of the windows, looking through the windows. They were piled up into the doors. They were standing in the hallways and they kept saying, we want what you have, we want what you have. I sat still for that entire period. I did not talk to anyone. I did not say anything. I just sat. That's all you do. What is going on? And then weeks later, I realised what was happening. When you ask, it happens. Some chemistry, some, some, I can't describe it, something happens. Now, let's, we'll go over this because this is the crux. This is where it gets really important. God is personality. Personality is the great universe paradox. It is permanence with constant change. This paradox exists because of our personalities, has origin beyond the time-space universe. God is the origin and destiny, destiny, God is also the destiny of personality. Life is eternal and God lives within us. That's what crystallised for me. Now, let's... Let's do an exercise. Any mindfulness practice, any mindfulness practice, if you invite the divine in to work with you, it will happen. That you can be assured of. What would it be like if 30 people did that as well as of two facilitators? What would happen if people who are watching one person do it in a meditation group, imagine what it would be like when 30 people do it and both the facilitators, both the facilitators are on the same page. I think it would supercharge Buddhism. The mighty ship of Buddhism... Let me give you an analogy. At the end of this pier, there is a huge ship. Fantastic. It's full of countless people and a brilliant crew. Let's call them teachers. But the ship is still tied up at the wharf. All it is waiting on is its captain. And the captain is the divine leading within. Once the captain boards the ship, that ship will set sail across the seven seas. So, I suggest when practicing mindfulness exercises of any type, invite your divine parent to join you. Explore. But now, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a few suggestions. When you acknowledge that you would like to have this dynamic going on, you want to go exploring. That's what I've been doing. I explore. I explore this territory. And I'm sharing with you my experiences. How does one have a relationship with God without any religious institution involved? Right? How can you do it personally? Ask. I mean, you are all beautiful people. You're all very gregarious. You're all very friendly. Okay? But God is not going to send you a text and say, let's have coffee tomorrow. All right? But if you ask, wow, different, very different. <clears throat> Joshua, 
Ben Joseph was, is a son of God. But he divested himself of every spiritual resource that he was, that he could have called or is embodied with. He divested himself of everything. All he wanted to do, not all, what he wanted to do was to demonstrate what a human can do with human potentials right, when working with his divine father. Many of the miracles in the earlier part of his life happened because he was aligning himself with his father's will and the miracles were happening around him. He didn't expect it. He was as shocked as much as anyone else. So, ask. And when you ask, you get choices. Do you want to go bike riding? Do you want to go to the movies? Do you want to go up in the hills and go camping? Or do I want to go to Mexico and enjoy a shamanic retreat and explore altered states of consciousness for 10 days? I chose to go into a war zone. It's about choosing. The better your selection of choice in the decisions that roll across the horizon towards you, the better the outcome. So ask, choose. Next, I have spoken to you about the God of personality. If you want another, I, I particularly like this one. See God as a friend. Fantastic. It's a, it, it's in, in that book, the Urantia book, in the very last or second last chapter, it, right at the, at the end of the chapter, it says, Jesus, Joshua, saw God as a friend. As a friend. The paradigm I'm suggesting to you is um, dynamic, it's full of relationship, it's not chained down by ritual or tradition or ecclesiastical authority, it is one-on-one -on -one and it was demonstrated 2,000 years ago. So, Here's another idea. As it says halfway down that slide, sincerity is spiritual food, sorry, spiritual fuel. The more sincerity you can muster, the further you will travel. I can, I can say that 100% confidence. The more sincerity you can generate in this situation, the further you will travel, the greater your personal growth. In fact, I believe this is the most powerful personal growth strategy you could possibly embrace. Choose a meaningful place, no phone, no phone, stop the phones. It's a distraction. Now, if you have a friend coming from overseas and you haven't seen them for five or ten years, where would you take them? Would it be to a mountaintop or a particular place on the beach or and you wanted to hang out with them? May I suggest, go there on your own without the mobile phone. It's a place where you would take your best friend and ask for a relationship. Ask to get, hey, I'd like to get to know you. This is who I am. What can we do? The sincerity is the fuel. Okay, at this moment, the individual now has spiritual sovereignty. You have total sovereignty over your life. Really empowering. 
During this period, you might like to make your own ritual and tradition. Why not? Those 360,000 texts in the Library of Congress all have got their own personal interpretations and traditions and rituals and all of that. That's their journeys. Have your own. Structure it. Watch, watch, watch the magic unfold. Okay. We're still deep diving. Once you are in this space, in this new we'll call it realm, I like the, this realm of activity. The journey is both inward and outward. If you share your internal life with the divine within, you, you, you've got it. You've got it absolutely down pat. That's the inward journey. The outward journey is a life of love and service. Now, this is where we start to get into the, the practical things and why many of the things that are happening in this world today aren't functioning the way they should, as we well know. So the outward expression is love and service. The inward expression is sharing your inner journey. That is your career. It is both in and out at the same time. Okay, levels of spiritual growth. Now that you're getting into it, who's walked down these paths before in history? Well, I've put them into three categories. Practitioners of service and doing good. Wow, you know the service organisations around this world? Rotary, Lions, um, who knows, countless service organisations. I suggest to you that they are very close to God without realising it, without realising it. They're unconditional. They don't have to go to church. In fact, I suggest that a lot of the people who are, attend churches are more, um, what's the word, disconnected, I guess, than those that are in service organisations and doing good. Then we move on to the masters of doing good and proclaiming truth. So they do two things. They do good, then they pr proclaim truth. Teachers. And then you get the grand masters, of which there have only been a handful, doing good, proclaiming truth, and then achieving oneness with God. It is, you can do it. You can do it. It's your destiny. It is the destiny of every human being. You are not born out of a whim. You have purpose, divine purpose. Every human being has a purpose on this planet and in this universe. Okay, practitioners, as I said, service organisations, service-minded individuals, masters, masters of this, Gautama, Buddha, Confucius, Lao Tzu, um, Sir Roaster or uh, Moses, Guru Nanak, very interesting fellow, founder of Sikhism, and Paul of Tarsus in the New Testament. Paul wasn't an apostle, he was the guy who walked along the road to Damascus and had the epiphany. And then you had the Grand Masters, Enoch and Elijah, Old Testament. Now there's something really interesting about this. You think as generations move forward that they become more intelligent and more dynamic and have a greater impact in the world and our society is more advanced than the societies 2,000 years ago. Possibly in part, but from a spiritual point of view, not necessarily so, because Enoch was the first person, first human being to achieve oneness with God. And when that happens, there's a specific dynamic. And it's rarer today than it was many years ago. So then we have in a league of his own, Joshua ben Joseph, AKA Jesus, achieved oneness with God by the age of 31 years and six months. I said in the beginning of this talk in session one that life, the meaning of life, has two purposes. One, 
you experience life, to discover your destiny. He mastered that. Joshua the man, not the son of God, I'm impressing upon you, Joshua the man, only using human capacities and abilities, achieved oneness with God by the time he was 31. That sets a challenge for every one of you. That's why if, if people in their 20s and late teenage years really go for it, you know, they can cover a lot of territory in 20 or 30 years. For us older guys, <laughs> you know, we're starting a little bit late. We've got a handicap. Okay. That's essentially, I'm restating what I've just said in that slide. It stands to reason if, a, I'll give you, why would a son of God de come down here and do all these magic tricks? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. You know, he, he's demonstrating. He, he's, he's showing you how it can be done. He's showing you all the worlds of the universe, what can be done. Okay, now we're getting into some more interesting territory. We talked about social service. Jesus taught the preeminence of the individual, spiritual sovereignty. That is the core of this divine truth that he always taught. The truth was you are a son and you are a daughter of God. Love each other. Work together. Now, in today's world, the preeminence of the individual does not sit very high in our social structure or social ladder. Okay, the will of man decisions determines his experience. Okay, we've talked about the way you decide, the way you choose determines your experience. Okay, so he taught the importance of will and the right, right way to choose. Then he taught fellowship, friendship with God. I've mentioned friendship. He taught that. He taught loving service and the transcendency of the spiritual over the material. In other words, the spiritual realm dominates, if you like, for want of a better word, the material world. Okay. So you've heard the word gospel and you think, oh, gee, you know, what's going on here, you know? The world has never really attempted to live correctly. It's always been hijacked. Brothers and sisters, you know, we are all children of God. I've tried, no, not I've tried. I've suggested to you that personality has divine origin. These are the values within that concept. Trust, forgiveness, respectful of free will, people's liberty, privacy, people's privacy, Compassion, generosity, tolerance, kindness, patience, honesty, service and love. These are the primary qualities of this realm, of this consciousness. By embracing those values and trying to live by them, you enhance your personal growth and you foster a noble personality. Now, a noble personality is the foundation stone of a long, enduring civilization. That is a fact. I've used the word realm. This is, I'm trying to suggest to you there is a realm that you can work in, that you can strive and explore, explore for yourself. Whatever I say, don't, don't, take, don't take my word for it. Just go exploring for yourself. Try it. Okay. Now, the following values retard personality. When embraced, the outcome is personality disintegration and civilization crumbles. These are abuse of trust, manipulation, deception, Controlling, 
Corruption, stealing, greed, blackmail. I'm sure a lot of you would realise or see examples of that in our society. It's not healthy. Our society is in grave danger. A lot of people are getting stressed. Okay, let's change the pace a little bit. A great teacher strives to be a good student and a great student strives to be a good teacher. I think it's incumbent upon all of us to try and be good teachers and good students in our lives. I think that's what we should strive to do. Now I'm going to uh, give you an idea that the spiritual universe, for want of a better description, doesn't, isn't perfect. It's evolving. It's growing. We're all growing. We're all part of it. And it works like this. When you learn something and someone's following you, you give them a hand and you lift them up. You share, with, you share your knowledge. You become the teacher. Come, you lift them up. And where you find yourself, you go, oh, then you accept a hand, you become the student, and you get lifted up. The entire universe, for want of a better word, is lifting itself up through evolution, through growth, through development. So I just gave you that as an idea of a concept that you may be able to work with. Okay. And we're back to the Friendship Garden of Jerusalem. When I was discussing about the tomb, I failed to mention that only about six were ever made, maybe ten at most. And why it remained hidden, we have no idea. It was like it was hidden behind some sort of strange energy that no one could see. Because Professor Mir Bendov was absolutely shocked when he found it. So, we discovered, we discovered that the land that the, that the tomb was located on was Islamic holy land for a long time. And Islamic holy land is called Waqf land. And on Waqf land, the trustees can only build a mosque, a school or a garden. So initially, when Martin and I discovered this information, we were prepared to visit the trustees of the Waqf in Jordan and ask them if they would like to participate in the building of the garden. Because at this stage, we were in the middle of negotiations with the Jerusalem municipality to take over control of the land. And this is about 2005. And then when we were doing further uh, investigations about the site, we were, it was, we were told that in, after the 1967 war, the uh, council expropriated the land from the Waqf and then publicly gazetted the, the land as a garden for the people of Jerusalem and Israel. So that was in 1967. Then in 2005, we put a proposal to the council that the Friendship Garden of Jerusalem Trust, of which I'm a trustee, would build the garden on behalf of the people of Israel, free of charge, to preserve the tomb. That was our intention. So after a decade of negotiations, uh, the Friendship Garden of Jerusalem project started. Now, um, I think I've given a reasonable summation of uh, the life of Joshua and what he tried to do. Um, where he was laid to rest. And yes, he did reappear after the crucifixion, three days after, he did reappear. 
He did appear to the women. Of the women evangelists, none betrayed him, none denied him. Whereas the apostles, the male apostles really struggled. Nevertheless, this is what happened. Um, Peter, one of the apostles, was so overcome, in fact all the apostles were so overcome by the resurrection that they kicked off a religion that was basically a relationship with the risen Christ and they'd forgotten all their teachings about having a personal relationship with God, about asking, about choosing and about developing their own personality. They simply had their socks blown off because this guy was resurrected. And it totally, it's a human error. You can understand it. If if someone reappeared, you would obviously be overcome and overawed and you would tend to forget. It just completely overshadowed all the teachings that Joshua gave to the apostles for quite a few years. So that kicked off Christianity in a different direction. Nevertheless, Christianity became a powerful force and is the foundation stone of Western civilization. So, um, so what I'm, uh, what the Garden Project is about, is about the individual having a personal relationship with God and a personal relationship with one another. That's why it's called the Friendship Garden of Jerusalem. We're trying to uncover the original values of what was taught 2,000 years ago. And hopefully this project will be a symbol of interfaith harmony because it was once Islamic Holy Land. It was then declared a garden for the people of Israel. And then through the generosity of the municipality, it was handed over to the trustees um, about 10 years ago. So now we're moving forward on the project and I'm going to explain a little bit more of the project after lunch. So thank you very much. Welcome, welcome to the third part of this talk. And again, it's very different to parts one and parts two. Okay, the Friendship Garden of Jerusalem project. It was inspired by the discovery of the tomb. And after a long period with uh, discussions with the municipality of Jerusalem, uh, a trust was established here in Australia and the trust has three trustees and the trust has one sole purpose and that is to build a botanic garden on this site in Jerusalem. Now, as I mentioned in session two, the history of this land is very intriguing, uh, having been both Islamic waqf land, uh, then it was uh, uh, publicly gazetted to be Uh, a a garden for the people of Israel and then the land was, uh, management of the land was handed over by the municipality of Jerusalem to the trust. So after a decade of, more or less a decade of negotiations, um, the agreement was signed uh, around about 2011. So when we received advice from our lawyers, HFN, that the agreement was signed, there was a lot of celebration by the three trustees and some friends, as you could well imagine. And at this stage, we were to appoint Professor Eric Meyer from Duke University in the United States to oversee the archaeological survey of the land. To, and then once that was completed, we could then plan the development of the garden. So it must be said 
that uh, the trustees are very, very grateful to the municipality of Jerusalem. Um, their generosity must be acknowledged um, because, as you know, uh, land there has been is contentious, and uh, they were very um, understanding, and so uh, the garden was all set to progress or work was set to start mid-2011. So, but it didn't turn out the way we expected. And this is what happened a couple of weeks after the contract was signed. The entire rock ledge was bulldozed with very heavy earth moving equipment. The damage, that's just part of the damage to the rock ledge. They would have needed some serious equipment to do what they did. They took out the entire ledge. So I did not feel particularly good that day when I saw that photograph because I felt I had failed. I had failed in protecting the tomb. And it was what I considered, we were about to announce the greatest archaeological discovery in 2,000 years. The bulldozing of that tomb ranks with the destruction of the Buddhas, I think, um, in Afghanistan, I think it was, I forget where they were, by the Taliban. Now, it took me a long time to process this situation. But then I started to resurface or surface. So this is a survey of the land that we had done during the process. And the green is the area of the land, which is quite significant. And it's about, as I said, near the... Um, American Colony Hotel, and it's about 800 metres north of the Damascus Gate. And it's in one of the most contentious areas in all of Jerusalem, as it would have to be. But the reason why I certified these documents, which I discussed in the first session, a decade before that destruction, was that I decided to write my report on the home in Nazareth and my report on the tomb and seal it, was that if one of the sites proved correct, by association, I could say the second site would have to be correct. Well, pretty much. So I used the principle of association is the best way to give a proof of two sites. So if one proved legitimate, there's a good chance the other would as well. And I, the reason why I made 300 of these is for events like this, because I thought, well, I'll just make a summary of the two discoveries and I can simply uh, take this legal document, run a, a knife down it, you know, open it up, and read what I wrote at the beginning of the two discoveries. So, in a way, the destruction of the tomb, in a strange way, is sealed in these envelopes. And I won't read it, but I might actually post it on my website. And it gives a lot of information about the home and the tomb. And there's a conclusion. Now, The point here, the really, the, the essence of the destruction of the tomb 
is this. No material place, no material place can give you spiritual growth. At best, it's a historical site. It may have uh, some, I don't know, uh, it may be just an emotional connection at best, but it doesn't actually um, provide any spiritual growth. The material cannot, um, uh, let me rephrase it. Earlier on in, in, in part two, I said the spiritual overrides or controls or is above the material. The material cannot work backwards. The material world cannot impact the spiritual life. So, if the tomb disappears, what does it mean? Well, it disappeared. It actually, um, perhaps, is good. How about that? I'm saying the destruction of the tomb is good. Because it means that all people can visit the site and just reflect. There's no building, there's no religious organisation built around it, there's nowhere where people can drop down and, and pray or, you know, they just have to be in their spirit. And I thought, hmm, it sounds a bit like building a garden like the Garden of Eden, doesn't it? So that's what I decided the garden should be like, a Garden of Eden, the Garden of Botanic Splendour. So, once the tomb was destroyed, it actually enabled me to rejig my approach. And with that in mind, I thought, well, let's proceed and start asking people to support the garden project. Well, this actually happened before the destruction of the tomb. This letter is from Dame Elizabeth Murdoch, one of the great philanthropists in, uh, of uh, Australia. And we had a meeting down at her farm, Cruden Farm, uh, as you can see in 2006. And she was a great supporter of this project. She saw great potential. And, she, and in the second letter, you'll see that she was also actively seeking uh, support from the director of the Botanic Gardens. Now, I'm not one for putting up uh, personal correspondence, um, but since Dame Elizabeth has passed on, this is more of an historical document, but I just wanted to give you uh, an idea of uh, the support that was coming in for this project, and I hope that in time, other people are inspired, like Dame Elizabeth Murdoch, to uh, support this botanic garden as well. She was a fantastic gardener. Her garden in Cruden Farm is really something to go you know, have a look at. Um, in fact, how I met Dame Elizabeth Murdoch, I was in fact a gardener. I was an, a gardener at a national trust house called uh, Como, Como House here in South Yarra. And um, she was on the garden committee and I was one of the gardeners and, and often there'd be a sort of small meeting about you know, what had to be done around the garden. So that's, what, uh, that's where the connection was. Um, so we are inviting all people from around the world to contribute to this building to this construction of, of this botanic garden. We're also inviting uh, uh, botanic collections from around the world to offer plants for the garden. We will make arrangements for those plants to be uh, sent to Israel, uh, quarantined, checked, and then they will be placed in the garden and they will be, everything will be noted and we'll be able to tell where the plants came from, who donated them, and obviously, you know, obviously we need funds. We'll be building um, uh, you know, large uh, irrigation systems and then there has to be facilities for the people. 
So we're going to make this a really special garden. So our goal is to raise $2 million and I'm giving myself 24 months and this uh, presentation is the first public presentation of our fundraising campaign. I'm giving you a quote from the book that I referred to and leave it with you. This sublime search for God of the universes is the supreme adventure of all inhabitants of all the worlds of time and space. Now, I shall close on sharing with you a discussion that I had 10 minutes ago in the courtyard while we were finishing lunch. And the young gentleman has a degree in astrophysics. And we talked about the James Webb Telescope. And I said to him, I said, I bet we will find evidence, very strong evidence, of extraterrestrial life within 10 years. And he, he agreed. He agreed. He says, it's, it's going to happen. And I can tell you that NASA are already sending staff to the Vatican to discuss the uh, implications. I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here. Joshua ben Joseph, the man, the son of God, who demonstrated how to live an ideal life and what can happen when you do it 2,000 years ago is actually what's referred to as a creator son of God. A creator son of God creates parts of the universe and within his domain in this small area, in this small pocket of his domain, there are upwards of 10 million inhabited worlds. So I said to my friend outside in the courtyard without giving him that number, I said, I know that we will find life on other planets very, very soon. So what I'm trying to, no, sorry, 10 million. Now, Son of God, it's incumbent upon a creator Son of God to experience the lives of all his creatures. And the last creature he had to experience was the human being, us. So he chose, he made a conscious decision to live a human life. Now, Of all the things that happen in a universe, this is, the most, this is the most perplexing. How does the Son of God consciously become a human being? Question unanswered. But the day after Mary was with child, the day after, the day after she fell pregnant, it wasn't a virgin birth, the day after she fell pregnant, Gabriel appeared and said, you are with child. So, I'm trying, what, I, what I'm trying to, to build here is increased perspective. Of all the inhabited worlds of 10 million in his particular area, and he is one of many, many creator sons, he chose this planet. You would not believe how special this planet is. But when he was crucified, the entire universe shuddered. The entire universe shuddered at the sight. Yet,
the uniqueness of the events and the um, discovery of the home and the discovery of the tomb puts the whole story together and concurs exactly with the information in that book that I mentioned precisely. Now, I said to my friend when we were sitting outside um, in the courtyard about life on other planets, I said, you know, I have this idea that religion is proportional to distance. And he goes, what do you mean? And I said, well, as man developed, he lived in a cave, his, his distance of operation was very limited, he hadn't learned to you know, train animals and so forth. So his religion was worshipping rocks or very basic, whatever was in the area, he sort of had this urge to spiritise. And then as he started to ride horses, he started to get the animal spirits coming in, his distance increased and so the, his religion evolved. And I said religion evolves uh, in, in part two. It's dynamic, it's always evolving, it doesn't stop. And so then he discovers the boats. So he starts sailing. So what happens? His gods start to move into the skies. You know, he's, he's charting from the stars and then the gods start to become you know, gods up in the, the many gods in the universe. So as distance increases, so does his religion to match. He, as distance, he, he, his religion always has to change to keep up with his physical, scientific growth. That's just, that's my theory. Now we've got a problem because the James Webb Telescope is just, um, just beginning its work and it is going to find extraordinary things. In about eight weeks, um, it will reach the right temperature and its uh, equipment, its infrared equipment, will start, will get into gear. So now we have a universe that is essentially limited, it, it, exponentially. We're learning about it uh, at a, an enormous rate and distances just keep going. Uh, the James Webb will be able to look further back and, uh, and increase our understanding of the universe more than any other telescope, greater than the Hubble. It's really important for us to feel comfortable in the universe. It's very important for us to feel that we're a part of it. It's a very important to have an emotional connection with the universe and not be overwhelmed by it all. The universe is not a cold mechanical clock. In fact, the universe is more of a living system. And as we photograph it more, if you keep that living system in your mind, you'll start to see that the universe is beautiful. It is, it is almost like a living system. It is not cold, it is not mechanical. So, The universe is evolving and we are evolving and we are part of it and we are sons and daughters. I'll keep hammering that. <laughs> so we are all part of the worlds of time and space and that's a direct quote from this book and that's why I ventured into this conversation I had about 10 minutes ago. Now, the first tree, the very first plant to be gifted to the Friendship Garden of Jerusalem has been gifted by some beautiful people here in Melbourne. Um, I'm sure they won't mind if I say they are practising Buddhists. Very heartfelt, heart-led mindful people and they heard about the Friendship Garden over dinner. In fact, at one of the restaurants that this person, one of these people own. And while we were having a very nice meal, discussions came up about the garden and out of the blue, a gift was offered. And I think this is a really nice gift and I don't think they realise how appropriate the type of tree that was gifted. And this is it. 
This is an olive tree. And it's the first plant to go into the Friendship Garden of Jerusalem. And all I can say is this tree will be front and centre in the garden. And I would like to thank Wang Duck, Top Chen, very much for your generosity and I look forward for it growing into a big tree. <laughs> thank you very much. So that pretty much wraps up um, the presentation about the discovery of the tomb and the home, about the meaning for the individual and this project in Jerusalem, which is, in my mind, both material and spiritual. It's a material expression of spiritual values and I do hope some inspiration and comes your way and you might like to help us build this garden. It'll be certainly something to behold when it's finished, whenever that will be. And so I would like to take this time to thank you for your attention today. Hope you've enjoyed it. And um, we may see you again somewhere around. And so uh, we shall keep you posted. You can visit my website and visit the website of the Friendship Garden of Jerusalem and watch its progress online. So um, I hope you got something from today, some inspiration, some aha moments, and um, I look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you so much.